Okay, welcome to the final video for the lecture six series, 6.3, and I'm going to introduce the idea of degrees of freedom and how it relates to the um, configuration and motion constraints of a system. So let's first define degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom of a system indicate the number of independent ways and the system is free to move in a reference frame. So for a holonomic system, there are n degrees of freedom one for each generalized coordinate. But non-holonomic constraints reduce these degrees of freedom. So for a system with n generalized coordinates, I guess I had the wrong screen here, but I'm not going to go back. You can read all of that. So for a system with n generalized coordinates, um, in reference frame A, with M, non-holonomic constraints, the P, degrees of freedom, are, P is defined as n minus m, where we get the degrees of freedom of the non-holonomic system. And this is the number of generalized coordinates, and this is the number of non-holonomic constraints. If there are no non-holonomic constraints, p equals to n, and we have uh, the degrees of freedom of the system. All right. So let's uh, take an example and think about it. New page. So I want to imagine a disk rolling on a sphere. Right. So I'm going to have a sphere. And I'll draw a meridian line there, or is that a... Uh... And then let's um, introduce some pieces here. So first I'm going to have a, a point on the sphere in which the disk has contacted the sphere, and we're going to call that point P. And we're going to locate point P on the sphere with some coordinates. So I'm going to put a little axis system here and make it like that. 
and then if I have a, a line drawn from the center of the sphere, which that doesn't look quite like the center of the sphere, let me adjust. So if the center of the sphere is here, that looks a little better. Then I can sketch out this these axes. Okay, so those are uh, perpendicular uh, lines there, and now I will sketch a line from there to there. And then if I project this down into the plane, like so, then we can see that. All right, so I want to pick uh, some coordinates now. So I'm going to call the angle from here to here, phi. That'll be our first coordinate. And then I'm going to take the angle from here to here as theta. And that will locate on the surface of the sphere of this point P with those two coordinates. And then we're going to have a disk, which I'll draw in blue. I'll rotate it a bit. This disk is going to be rolling on the sphere. And if we remove that, it should look approximate. All right, so this disk is rolling in a sphere. It's in contact at point P there. And let's see, I want to call the sphere, oops, oops, I want to call the sphere S, and we'll call the disk D, okay? Disk is rolling in a sphere. We located the point of uh, contact in the sphere uh, with this uh, phi and theta terms and then if I um, draw a line here that represents um, a line this line that I'm going to draw is going to be in this plane that uh, this triangle here that I'm following is in so if I have a line and I'll draw a dotted line. It's going to be in that triangle's plane. Let me go back to black. Okay. And actually, I want to draw the angle a little more. So let's do that. And then the disk is going to be pointed in a way and rolling in a direction that is a coordinate. A, a gamma. So I'm going to call this gamma. So if I look at a plane that's tangent to the sphere and I draw a line which is this triangle projected up into that plane and then the disk is rolling um, an angle gamma uh, relative to that line. So the disk could roll in any direction around the sphere, so we need this third coordinate, gamma, to tell us what direction that disk is rolling. All right, so those uh, are those three coordinates. And now I'm going to look um, directly um, along the edge of the disk. And if I do so, I would get a view that looks like, like this. All right, and I'll draw the disk in blue again. So I'm going to look directly along the disk so it only looks like a line. And if I draw then a, a line here that goes through the center of the sphere, 
I can then uh, have the angle that the disk has leaned over and we'll call that beta okay So now the disk is leaned over. And then we need one more coordinate. The disk is rolling, so it needs a spin angle. And so if I uh, look at the disk directly on its side, I forgot to put point P here. But if I look at the disk directly on its side, it would be in contact with the sphere at point P. And the disk has uh, some center. And if I um, draw a line that's fixed on the disk, I'll recognize that like so. And then I always have a line from the center to the contact point. Then I can define an angle, a spin angle of that disk, which we will call alpha. All right. So we locate the point with phi and theta, and then the disk can a yaw, sort of, with this gamma term. Right? That's the direction that it's uh, pointed. Uh, and then it also has a, a, a lean angle, or a roll angle, beta. And then it has this spin angle, gamma. All right, so we've now described the configuration of the disk. And um, we have then, uh, five generalized coordinates. Phi, theta, gamma, beta, and alpha. And if we specify all five of those, that's a minimal set to fully configure the disk in S. Uh, okay, so, um, this means that we have n equal to 5 there. The next thing that I want to then impose are some motion constraints. So a very common uh, motion constraint is that uh, this wheel or disk would roll without slipping on the surface of the sphere. So what that means is that we're going to specify something about the velocity relationship between the disk and the sphere here. Um, but let's talk uh, briefly about rolling without slips so that we can know what we're doing. So if I have a wheel or a disk, All right, so we've got a, a disc here, and then I will add the ground that it's in contact with. Like so, and we get a contact point. There, I'll call that S in this case. There's also a center, I'll call that O. And call the wheel A and the ground M. All right. So we know that if we roll this disk, it will have some angular velocity. And I'll just write omega here as a scalar. Um, it has a angular spin rate. And the center of the wheel, we can imagine that it has um, a speed v, right? Now, if this wheel is rolling without slipping, it will um, advance forward. Um, let's also indicate the radius of this wheel. I'll call that little r. And we want to think about um, the velocity 
at a few points. I'm going to make this point P here, and I'll make a point Q there. Okay. So if I think about the velocity in N of these various points, um, the velocity of O and N is uh, just V, right? Um, but due to the rotation of this, we can think about then the velocity of, for example, point P and N. And we can use the two-point theorem. So if we know that um, the velocity of uh, O already, we have the velocity of O and N, it's just V plus omega of A and N crossed with that vector from O to P. Right? So the magnitude of this is simply going to be V plus, we have omega, if I cross that, uh, I'll get an omega R term. All right? And that vector is going to look something like this and uh, the magnitude v plus omega r there similarly if i think of the velocity of point s where s is a point that's fixed on the disk and it's at the contact point at this time we're investigating um, now well, that's the velocity of O and N plus omega of A and N crossed. And the only difference is it's from O to S. Well, this time, uh, this component is in the, in the opposite direction of the uh, V direction that I have here. So the magnitude of S and N is actually going to be V um, minus omega r, right? But if we roll without slip, when viewed from n, this velocity is equal to zero. And that means that v equals omega r when we have no slip. And if that's the case, then the velocity of p and n I substitute in, we either get 2v or 2 omega r. Right? So p is moving at twice the velocity, v of v, and the point s has zero speed. And uh, if you take any points along the disk there, you basically can draw this line and get the velocity of any point on, the verti on this vertical line of the disk. Now, point Q, it has a velocity too, but it's going to just be of um, length V, but in that direction, okay? So we can um, calculate the velocity of any point. The no-slip condition, though, is that when viewed from N, if we take a snapshot of this rolling disk, this point, um, if there is no slip, S will have a velocity of zero. So that is um, a velocity constraint that we'll have to keep in mind. And so if we come back to our disk rolling on a sphere, um, we can impose that um, no slip idea too. So if the wheel rolls without slip, on the disk, uh, there are m equals two non-holonomic constraints. Okay, so if that point P 
is the point fixed in D, right? fixed in disk D. that is um, located at the contact point. Between the disk and the sphere. Then we can write that the velocity of that point P when viewed from the sphere equals to zero. Right? And that's going to give two components of velocity in the tangent plane of the contact. All right, so we now can calculate our degrees of freedom. P equals, we have five generalized coordinates minus uh, five two non-holonomic constraints to give us three degrees of freedom. So we have a three degree of freedom system of just a disc rolling without slip on a sphere. Um, you can we'll expand that a little bit. So if the sphere is moving freely in a new reference frame in, so if I have some reference frame here in, right, and then that sphere can translate and rotate with respect to n and a point fixed in n, then there's six new generalized coordinates So we get those six new ones. That means that we have now P equals our original five plus the six, 11, minus the two roll without slip constraints. It's gonna leave us with nine degrees of freedom in that system. All right, so that's a basic way, uh, way to see how you calculate the degrees of freedom of a system. Okay, now I want to talk about um, independent and dependent generalized speeds. Okay, so these non holonomic constraints uh, introduce relationships between the generalized speeds. So we should be able to solve for some of them in terms of the others, and that's going to make a independent and dependent relationship. All right. So with generalized speeds u, defined, the non-holonomic constraints can be rewritten. So we can have our non-holonomic constraint vector function there. They're now a function of the u's, the q's, and the t's. 
penalty. But they don't have any Q dots anymore because we've we can replace all of the Q dots with our definitions of uh, using our definitions of the U's. And then uh, the dimensionality of here is is this is uh, the same, right? This is uh, in M, right? There's M constraint equations, and then both U and Q will have the dimension uh, little n. All right, so we now have this uh, constraint equation written in terms of the U's. And the non-holonomic um, constraints imply, and then we could have this uh, dependency among the U's. So we should be able to solve these equations and find the dependency of M M dependent coordinates. All right. So I want to write that uh, M generalized speeds. Can be selected as dependent depend as uh, dependent generalized speeds and we're going to call those um, u subscript r um, and that would leave P independent generalized speeds. We're going to call these independent generalized speeds U subscript S, right? So that means then we can write that our constraint equations, uh, if I just separate uh, U into UR and US, Q, T um, equals to zero, and then we have UR's dimensionality is RM, and US is P, which remember is n minus m. Okay. Also, um, the generalized speeds are all linear. Um, okay, so that, sorry, the holonomic constraint equations are linear. Ah, I'm screwing that all up. The non-holonomic constraint equations are linear in all of the speeds. Okay, so that is uh, because we are uh, selecting these uh, measure numbers of different velocities and we've taken derivatives of the um, uh, configuration uh, related vectors that will get uh, terms that are always linear in these. So the, this equation actually can be written like so. So I can have some matrix AR times UR minus a matrix AS times us, right, so they're linear in the ur's and the us's, minus some remaining term, we'll call this vector brs, and that equals to zero. Um, and then if we write the equations that way, which you can, um, then we can solve for the ur. So the dependent speeds are then a R inverted times A S U S plus B R S. Right. 
and then I can introduce some new variable names here a n u s plus b n where a n equals a r minus one a s and b n equals a r inverted b r s right so the use the dependent use can be written in terms of the independent use and it's just this linear relationship between those two all right so i want to close then with an example to show how we uh, operate with these so let me do a new page and i need to sketch out a bit of a, a little more complicated sketch here so it'll take me a minute um, all right let's start with a reference frame a so i'm going to give some unit vectors for a like so and this is going to be a y a x and a c all right and then um, we're going to have a trailer a simple trailer that is moving in this reference frame A, basically, relative to some fixed point in A. And uh, I'm going to first locate the hitch of that trailer here, and I'm going to call that P. And the, pit, the, the hitch is going to be on a line and I'm going to give this unit vector here a name in hat and there's a line here it's not looking that great there we go boom Okay, so we have this line. This line is in a plane parallel to the A uh, X Y plane, and uh, we locate this point P like so. All right, we're going to call that the hitch, and then I'll draw this uh, frame in a different color. Um, I did. I'm do that a little bit too. This would be okay. Uh, it's not ideal. Let me just redraw this. Sorry. Draw this at a bit of an more of an angle. All right. So we've got this line parallel to the plane uh, x y. And then I'll have this unit vector in, which is not dashed. There we go. And then in, like so. And we'll have P here. Yeah, that's better. P. And now I'm going to draw this trailer. All right, so the trailer has a vertical bar. And then it's going to have uh, a horizontal bar that's uh, uh, parallel to the XY plane. And then we have a, a piece that comes down. And then finally, we, and I'll do that in a different color, there's a wheel. looks like that all right so the wheel is going to be D and the frame is going to be E and I'm going to add some unit vectors on the frame we're going to have uh, two unit vectors like this that represent the unit vectors for the E-frame. Uh, 
and we'll have a uh, e z and um, an e x along the frame. Right. And then I want to draw a dash black line. I think so. It should be parallel. Let's see if I can move D up a little bit. There we go. Squish it. That looks pretty good. All right, so we've got a trailer frame, this purple E, and then I've got a, a disc. Okay. So both of these dash lines are in the XY plane, the AXY plane there, or parallel to that plane, and uh, and lie in the same plane. Okay. All right. What else do I need to give you? I need to give you some coordinates. So um, this angle is going to be. If I can ever get okay, this angle. We'll have a coordinate here. I'm going to call this Q2. All right. And then um, the distance from there. This is going to be Q1. All right, so Q1 gets the location of the pit, uh, the hitch P in the plane, and then Q2 we could call the yaw angle um, of the uh, purple frame. Okay, and um, we're going to need a Q3 to get the spin angle of the wheel in the frame here, and I'm going to define that by. I'll, I'll put a line here that's fixed in the D-frame, like so, and then we'll have an angle uh, Q3, that's that angle. All right. I need a couple of dimensions, let me pick another color for the dimensions, do I have a, I don't have a dark blue yet. Uh, the disc will have a radius. R, okay. Uh, this top bar is going to be a length L. Get straight lines there. L and so from there to there is L. And then uh, the height here, and I think I'm missing one point, Q. This point I'm gonna call Q. The height of Q is going to be, uh, let's use blue again. Uh, I'm gonna have this dimension is, I'll call it A plus R. Okay, let's see if I have everything that I want to draw here. Point O, I don't have point O. Point O, we're going to call the center of the disk. And I'm going to call point S this contact point here. All right, I think that I've got everything. Okay. So, uh, to put a few things here in, in words, we've got a simple trailer, E, and it has a wheel, D, that rolls without slip, on the plane that is uh, normal to AZ. Okay. 
Okay. This uh, disk D is always perpendicular to the plane. And the hitch P is pulled in the in hat direction. All right. Okay, let's divine uh, a few things here. Right, we have um, our generalized coordinates. Q1, Q2, and Q3. Um, I'm going to write cosine of QI as CI and sine QI as SI for each of those numbers. And then let's work out our uh, positions and velocities that we're going to need. So first, in hat. Um, ends up being C2 E1 plus uh, sine of Q2 uh, oops this is supposed to be EX and uh, EY right so um, I can express the in hat in the uh, reference frame of the, of the trailer there like so and uh, now let's write a few velocity uh, expression. So the velocity of P in A is going to be the time derivative of Q1 dot in that in hat direction. Right. The velocity of Q in A is the same as the velocity of P in A, Q1 dot in hat. All right. The angular velocity of E in A is Q2 dot Z. And we can write then um, omega of D in A is going to be omega of E in A plus omega of D in E and then the omega of D and E is a simple rotation and that's Q3 dot in the E Y direction. Alright so some those are the uh, easiest velocities to, to determine here. Now let's calculate um, some that are a little trickier okay so the velocity of O the center of the wheel we could use our two-point theorem to do that so the velocity of O and N must equal to the velocity of Q and N plus omega of E uh, in A crossed with the vector from uh, O from Q to O. Right? So if we do that, um, we know that we have a Q1 dot in hat, and then um, omega of E and A we've figured out, and uh, it is in the uh, wrote that right. Omega of E and A is supposed to be a negative there. So we can then write negative Q2 dot in the uh, easy crossed with this vector, which is negative L E X minus A E Z. Okay take that one step further and then we can write that Q1 dot C2 
ex plus q1 dot sine of q2 plus l q2 dot in the ey direction. All right, so that gives us the velocity of O and N. And we have components in the EX and the EY direction there. Now we want to get the velocity of S and N. Okay, so S is this point that is fixed in D and it's always at the contact point. And we're going to use that to set up our non holonomic constraints for the rolling without slip. So the velocity of S and N, we just figured out the velocity of O and N. And then we can do the cross product of E and N, uh, omega of E and N with the vector from S from O. Right. So what is that going to look like? Um, we already have this written above. Oh, oh, not write that, but the cross product is going to be a Q1, I'm sorry, a Q3 dot, um, a Y minus a Q2 dot, and the EZ, right? So that we had to have those two terms. We cross that then uh, with this vector, which is minus R in the E Z direction. If you take that cross product and combine it with the velocity that we already have, you should be able to arrive at Q1 dot cosine Q2 minus R times Q3 dot in the EX direction plus Q1 sine, Q1 dot sine of Q2 plus L Q2 dot in the E Y direction. And so that's the velocity of S and N. But if we want rolling without slip, then this is going to have to be equal to zero. So the S of N equals to zero. And that's going to give us our two non-holonomic constraints. All right. So we have two components in this EX and EY, the plane there. And uh, we now arrive at our non-holonomic constraints. must equal zero and q1 dot sine of q2 plus l q2 dot equals zero. So m equals two, we have non holonomic two non holonomic constraints. P then we had three generalized coordinates minus two constraints equals one. So we only have one degree of freedom for this trailer. All right, so we've got our non-holonomic constraints. And the next thing to do is um, let's set up uh, our dependent and independent speeds. So new page here. Um, I'm going to define some general, generalized speeds. I'm going to say that u1 equals q1 dot, but then I'm going to say that u2 equals the velocity of s in a, and was I writing a? Uh, all these should have been a. Uh, I'll fix them all real quick. All right, these should have been a, a, a. I think the n hat got stuck in my mind. These are a, 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 and a. Sorry about that. This is supposed to be a2. Okay, they were all in the reference frame 
A, not N. We got no reference ring in. Okay, so velocity of S and A dotted with uh, E X, and that's going to give us that expression. And this happens to be the same expression that we used in our velocity constraints. And that's Q three dot, and then similarly U three is going to be the dot product of S and A with E Y. That would be Q1 dot sine of Q2 plus LQ2 dot. All right, so we're going to find these generalized speeds. And then we can write our kinematic differential equations. Right, They should fit this form. Um, we're going to have a Q vector, Q1, Q2, Q3. Similarly, a u vector, u1, u2, and u3. And then uh, we can figure out what y is by inspection. We have 1, 0, 0 for u1, and then cosine, sine, cosine of q2, 0, negative r, and uh, sine of q2, l0. And then also by inspection, there is no, once again, no ZK term, right? So we have uh, our, general, our uh, equations here. If I solve for the Q dots, you'll then find that uh, Q1 dot equals U1, Q2 dot, ends up being negative u1 sine of q2 divided by l plus u3 and q3 dot equals u1 cosine of q2 divided by r minus u2. So yk is invertible. We can find these kinematical differential equations that are in terms of our new u terms. Okay, so now let's rewrite our non holonomic constraints in terms of the U's. So if we do that, then our non-holonomic constraints end up being quite simple because we defined u1, I'm sorry, u2 and u3 to be the equations for the non-holonomic constraints. So all we, we now know that u2 and u3 simply equal to zero. Um, if you think about these linear terms, uh, the matrices A R, A S, and such, right? They're going to be quite simple in this case. Uh, A R will be an identity. A S to zero. B R S also zeros. And if we were to um, formally solve those equations for u2, u3, uh, minus 0 times u1, minus 0, 0 equals 0, 0. Then we just arrive at u2 and u3 equal to 0. But if you have more complex expressions, um, you'll have to actually solve those equations. So with this in mind, we now know that u2 and u3 equals 0. So um, Q1 dot equals U1 as normal. Q2 dot equals negative U1 S uh, sine of Q2 divided by L. But um, the U3 term goes away. And then Q3 dot equals U1 C2 
over R, where the U3 term, 2 term goes away. So those simplify. And then if we rewrite our velocity terms, or, or, or our velocities, all in terms of the independent generalized speed U1, that's all we have left, U1. Then we can see that the velocity of P and A is going to equal to the velocity of Q and A, and that equals U1 in hat. The velocity of O and A is U1 C2 in the x direction. The velocity of S and A is zero, right? And then omega of E and A equals negative U1, S2 divided by L in the E, Z direction. Omega of D and A equals the negative U1, S2 over L in the E, Z plus the u1 uh, cosine of q2 over r in the y direction. Okay, So these velocities now are quite simple, and we've written them only in terms of the independent generalized speed u1. So right, ur is u2 and u3, the dependent speeds, which happen to be zero the way we've defined them and then us the independent speed is only u1 and we can rewrite all of the velocities in terms of these uh, defined generalized speeds to get uh, a simpler scenario Okay, so to summarize uh, this lesson, we've got a lot of pages here, a little bit long. We talked about degrees of freedom, okay? The non holonomic constraints will reduce your degrees of freedom. Um, so any holonomic system has n degrees of freedom, any non holonomic system has p, which is equal to n minus m. m are the number of non holonomic constraints. We looked at this disk rolling on a sphere, and um, we had five generalized coordinates that fully configured the disk on the sphere. And then we introduced the two non-holonomic constraints associated with this rolling without slip uh, idea uh, to reduce the degrees of freedom to three. We then introduced the idea of independent and dependent generalized speeds. Okay, it turns out that the uh, 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 non-holonomic constraint equations are always linear in the independent and dependent speeds so you can solve um, for the dependent speeds in terms of the independent speeds and then we did this trailer example where we uh, had a rolling without slip wheel that gives us two non-holonomic constraints for um, these three generalized coordinates we get a one degree of freedom system and we're able to write all of the velocities in terms of this single independent generalized speed to make a fairly um, simple expressions for the velocity terms. Okay, well, that's it and uh, ends the lessons for this week.